right, good morning, Grace family. Please open your Bibles to the book of Romans. We're in Romans today, and we're embarking on an eight-part series on what we value. We're going to explore our eight distinctive values as a church, one at a time. Today, God-centered worship. Before I read the word, let me just tell you why this is so important. Much of the American church has drifted dangerously and swerved from the, church, from the truth. Uh, a lot of churches have trusted man's wisdom rather than God's, and we always need to humble our hearts before God, and we always need to realize that we could drift over time if we're not careful. You can drift over time and not even realize it. And our values are, are kind of like markers that uh, pilots or ship captains would use uh, to um, make sure they're going the right way, some sort of landmark or a lighthouse. And they're in, of critical importance to stay on course. And that's what our values are to us. It matters that we stay devoted to these things. So stand with me, please. I'm going to read. I'm going to actually start reading in Romans 11:33 today and then go down to 12 verse 2. So stand with me to read God's word. This is, I'm going to remind you again, this is the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. It is not the word of man. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Lord, we thank you that we can be here today and we can acknowledge you for who you are, that your riches and wisdom and knowledge are unsearchable and your ways are so much higher than ours, your thoughts so much higher than ours. Lord, we come to you acknowledging that from you and through you and to you are all things. And we want to glorify you today. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way in our hearts, Lord, that you, by your Spirit, through your Word, would transform us today. All for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I love Grace Church of Orange with all my heart. And I mean the people, not the place. Sure, we have a great place to meet. We have great spots to meet in the community as well. But I mean the group of people that God has chosen and gathered and linked together by common faith in Christ. The group of people that are being made holy by God, who are loved by God who are united in our love for Jesus and one another and his mission in the world. And you can think of it like this. We are on a journey to eternity together. Believers are on a journey to eternity together. The Bible is our compass. The Holy Spirit is our guide. The church, our family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we want more than anything to glorify God through lives transformed by the gospel. A Christ-centered community intent on proclaiming the gospel and 
making disciples and sacrificially serving Jesus. And we make that pretty clear. But what matters to us based on all that? What is distinctive about our common life together? What should we be observed doing based on our faith in Christ? And this is where, as a church, we are marked by our distinctives. This is where these values come in. Eight distinctive values. Today we're looking at God-centered worship. Also, as we go on through this series, Christ-centered preaching, gospel change relationships, multi-generational ministry, Christ-honoring service, God-confident outreach, humble, bold leadership, and God-dependent prayer. And we'll look at each one in order. And I'm going to be following a simple outline each week. First, why do we value this? Why do we value what we value? Beyond the obvious, well, because God does. We'll show from the word why God values it and why we should too. And then what are the barriers and how can we grow? Like we grow in this value. And so with that, we're just going to dive right into God-centered worship and ask that question. Why do we value this? Why is this so important? Why is this listed first? And we're in Romans 11, verse 36 to 12, verse 2. And the main idea there is God-centered worship. That God wants us to live in conscious, consecrated, continual God-centered worship. We need to know what that is. It's like, oh, it's worship centered on God. Okay, let's go deeper than that. We need to know what that is, and, and we're now, we just landed in at the end of Romans 11, and now we're getting into Romans 12 a little bit, and soon I'm going to be preaching a, a series verse by verse through the entire book, but here we just airlifted right into Romans 12, okay, pretty much. And um, you got to know that what happens in Romans 12, all the way to chapter 16, is built on everything that is said in Romans chapters 1 through 11. Very obvious point here. Romans 1 through 11 uh, speaks of the gospel's power for salvation. What God has provided for us in Christ. But then Romans chapters 12 through 16 deals with the gospel's power for living. How we are to live in light of what God has done for us in Christ. How the gospel affects your life. It's dependent on God. Like verse 36 says, from him and through him and to him are all things. It's directed to God for him, as Paul says there at the end of of verse 36, for his glory, to God be the glory. And I want to make several comments as we start regarding God-centered worship, what it is. The first thing I want to mention to you is that it is conscious God-centered worship is conscious. It's not a mindless activity where you really don't know what you're doing, but you know what you're doing because of who God is and what he's done for you in Christ. It isn't just about knowing God, but knowing him personally through Christ. Because you either know God through faith in Jesus Christ or you do not know God. And if you know Jesus Christ, you consciously worship him. And that's from God. From him to us via the gift of faith, we're privileged, believers are privileged to worship God through Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse 36. It's a great summary of praise to God for his wisdom and his wonders and his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. This is the the summary of Romans chapters 1 through 11. Everything he has done for us in Christ. It's from him, it's through him, it's to him. So to him be the glory forever, amen. Paul lifts his heart and prays to God. God. 
Reminds us of Isaiah 55, where the ungodly and sinful are urged to return to the Lord to find mercy. Because God's thoughts and God's ways are infinitely higher and better than ours. And, and what you see here is that God is not vindictive, but he is gracious. His plans defy the human mind. His ways surpass your ability to reason them out. And what you see here, and really in those final verses of chapter 11, is that God doesn't lean on anyone for advice. That he doesn't depend on human help. He is not indebted to people. No, he is, as verse 36 says, he is the source, he is the means, he is the goal, and the reason for everything. And so Paul gives this exalted praise in view of God's sovereign salvation plans that are laid out so beautifully in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And it applies to our individual lives, it applies to our life together as believers. Think about your life. Your life is sourced in God, from God. And you live by his resources. You live by the air and the water and the food and everything else that God provides And your life will return to God in his preordained timing. So to God be the glory. And what you'll notice there in these verses is there's a shift in the train of thought when you go from verse 36 to chapter 12, verse 1. That the the explanation of how sinful man can be made right with a holy God is now over But more must be said. You can't just stop there. Because when you're made right with God through faith in Christ, you need to know how to live. You need to know the difference it makes. You need to know what God expects of you. You need to know how to apply all the resources and riches you have in Christ to all the situations of your life. And so what you see in chapter 12, verse 1, are imperative commands beginning that were not present in the first 11 chapters. And the, par- the imperative commands, basically do this, live like that, starts in Romans 12.1, and they're built upon the indicative truths of chapters 1 through 11. The indicative tells you what God has done. The imperative tells you, here's God's commands, and here's what he expects of us based upon what he has done. And so let's look at verse 1. Paul dives right in. I appeal. He's in a very strong word here. It means something between command and ask strongly. He's not necessarily saying you have to do this, but he's not saying, you know, this is a suggestion. There's an authority to what he says. He's saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. There's an authority. It's a strong word, appeal. He's basically saying, do what I say. Do this. You need to do this. I appeal to you, therefore, establishes the connection with Romans 1 through 11. And Paul is now urging us instead of instructing us. He's not just teaching about what is going on. He is, he is urging strongly, do this. And the basis of his appeals is God's mercies. What are God's mercies? You know, you see the mercy of God in chapter 9 of Romans and chapter 11, and you just see a golden thread all the way through the book of Romans. But here, it's, it's bigger. It's the mercies of God, the multiplied mercies of God, the myriad mercies. If you can imagine a, a big pile of mercies stretching all the way up to heaven, that what it means, the mercies of God, is great mercies. It's his great compassion. We deserve the worst from God, and we get the best of God. God, in his mercy, moves to deliver us from our state of sin and, and misery by saving us in Christ. So what Paul is saying is that in light of everything God has done for us in Christ, the shed blood of Christ, the substitution of Christ in our place, 
regeneration, him, him giving us new life, God drawing us to himself in mercy, God not giving us the punishment our sins deserve, and then lavishing grace upon us, giving us undeserved favor. Paul is saying that God-centered worship is the conscious act of faith in response to all of that. And so God-centered worship is a conscious act of faith. You know you're doing it, and you want to. The second thing I'll point out about God-centered worship is that it is consecrated. It is consecrated. It's a commitment. It's a, it's a declaration. It's like, Lord, my life is yours, and it is through him. It is willed by him, but it's enabled by his power. So in verse 1, Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's appealing to believers to dedicate their whole life to God's service. And he's appealing to people who have experienced the misery of their sin. But they've also experienced the deliverance that is in Christ. So if you've experienced the misery of your sin, the Holy Spirit is convicted of your sins, and, and you know you need a Savior, and you've turned to Christ in faith, now you have experienced deliverance given by Jesus, will your heart is going to respond in love and gratitude to God. It's the practical outcome of the gospel. It's like Psalm 116, verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? But only a conscious, intelligent consecration or commitment of your life in light of God's gift of salvation will do. Nothing else will suffice. And Paul says, present, present yourself to God. It literally means to place beside. It's like, like I picture a conveyor belt, okay? A conveyor belt that's moving past you, and you present yourself there, and then it just keeps on moving past you, away from you, out of your control. You're consciously presenting yourself to God. Now, don't miss this. You're either doing that, or you're consciously presenting yourself to the world. We are not puppets. We are not marionettes. There's not strings attached. And you do what you want at any given moment. You want to be here. That's why you're here. You say, well, no, I got forced to come. You chose to come. But the question then is, who or what do you present yourself to? The word present gives another picture too. It's like a helicopter flying over a parade. And it sees the beginning and the middle and the end of the parade. It sees the whole picture. This is the whole picture of your life. It's not, oh, you did it once and check the box. This is, this is remember he says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. This is the whole process. There's this, you know, oxymoronic, counterintuitive aspect to this, a living sacrifice. They don't usually fit together. Living sacrifice. It, my first thought goes to Abraham and Isaac in, in you know, Genesis 22, where you're like, God said to Abraham, you, you go on this mountain and you, you offer your son as a sacrifice. And he fully intended to obey that and, and kill his son. And he put him on the altar in total submission and obedience on both their parts. You don't see you know, Isaac being said of, of wiggling off the, the pile of wood. Sacrifice. What do you do with the sacrifice? It dies. How are you a living sacrifice? Because Jesus said it very clearly. You die to yourself. You deny yourself. You, you, you be consumed. Hebrews 12, 28 says that we should offer God acceptable worship. Same word for worship here. Because our God is a consuming fire. And a lot of believers say, oh yeah, I better be really good, boy or girl, because if I'm not, God's going to zap me with fire. He's going to consume me. That is a complete misunderstanding of that verse. What it means is you, you, you offer yourself a living sacrifice and God consumes you in the best possible way and uses you for his purposes, uses you for his glory. 
Die to self, deny yourself. And, and there's no partial option. You know, it's not like, well, can I do the 50% plan? Can I just be partially a living sacrifice? You know, just maybe a segment of my life. How about when I come to church and maybe go to my home group and, you know, my men's or my women's group, but the rest of the time, could I have that to myself? It's not an option. This is not an option. It's full surrender we're talking about here. And you don't sacrifice to get mercy. That's what the pagans do. That's what unbelievers do. They say, I'm going to, you know, sacrifice so that God will owe me something. That's a complete misunderstanding of the Bible. Uh, you, you, God's mercy provides you the basis to sacrifice your life. It's the proper response to God's mercy. And Paul says this, this living sacrifice, still in verse 1, is holy and acceptable to God. Acceptable. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, the acceptable sacrifices had to be unblemished, they had to be whole, they had to be the best, they had to be consecrated. And he says, this is your spiritual worship. He's speaking to believers. He said, brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God. Because only a true believer can give God true worship. You realize right this very moment and all day long and, uh, you know, it'll keep on happening that there are millions and millions of people around the entire globe that think they are worshiping God. And they're worshiping Satan, or they're worshiping themselves, or they're worshiping the figment of someone's imagination. And they are not worshiping God. No one but a true believer can truly worship God. Now, if that makes you uncomfortable, I'm glad, because the truth often makes us uncomfortable. The only true worship is that through Jesus Christ, by grace through faith. The rest of it's false. And you are either a believer or you aren't. You're either on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. There's no, again, there's no, you know, can I be in the middle ground? The woman at the well, speaking to Jesus, knew it quite well. John chapter 4. She understood this. And Jesus even said, the Father is gathering worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. The only people that can worship God in spirit and in truth are true believers who've been regenerated by God, who've been born again to a living hope. No one but a true believer can truly worship God. But, this should be scary. A true believer can worship falsely. True believer can worship falsely. What's false worship? You know, what does it look like? You're, you're, you're probably thinking, oh no, what if I didn't feel it during the worship today? By the way, you shouldn't be talking like that, okay? But what, what, what if I didn't feel it during the worship today? Does it mean I'm not worshiping rightly? Uh, did I not really worship? Maybe. Not necessarily, though. Only God knows your heart. Only God knows your motives. Only God knows what you're thinking right now. You may be really, really self-centered and look really holy. I don't know. Only God knows. But the question you, you want to ask yourself is, whose eyes do I care about most? What am I doing when I'm coming in here? What am I doing when I'm leaving? What was I doing before I got here? What am I thinking about? What am I planning? Sometimes we take what is pure and introduce impure elements into it, and there's a corrupting influence. Here's an Old Testament quote for you. Make us gods to lead us. Oops, two golden calves. Woo they just popped out of, the, out of the fire. No, they were, fr they were fashioned by the heart and the mind of man. They were worshipped. And, and knee the knees of man and the hearts of man poured out themselves to golden calves. And, and all around the globe, and, and it might be happening in your life too, there are people just worshiping false gods, conforming to the world, pressed into its mold, which leads to cor corruption and confusion. And, and, and God wants full consecration. I didn't say perfection, consecration. We offer yourself to Him, you present yourself to Him. You'll see in a moment. What happens as a result? But God-centered worship is a conscious 
decision on your part where you consecrate yourself to God. Now, one more aspect about what God-centered worship is. It, it's not only conscious and, and consecrated. It is, it is continual. It's continual. It, it is to God. It is from us to God. And, and you can put it this way. Parents, you know how you uh, think sometimes about your kids and you think, you know, that was willful disobedience that you just did? Well, this is willful obedience, okay? You willingly obey God. So look at verse 2. I'll move on to verse 2 here. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, there's a couple things you need to know. First, the verbs here, be conformed and be transformed, are passive, not active. It's being done to you. So these are commands, these are imperatives, but it's not a command to go do some transforming on yourself or to do some conforming of yourself, non-conforming of yourself, excuse me. It means to have someone else transform you. It's like when you have an operation. How many of you have had an operation before? Operation, yeah, okay. So my most memorable one was in 2004. It was an emergency appendectomy, okay? I thought I was going to die. Drove myself to one hospital. It was a long wait, and I drove myself to another one because I thought I was going to die. You know, I had to get some help. But here's the deal. I didn't operate on myself. I didn't say, hey, give me that scalpel. Oops! <laughs> No, it was done to me. The operation was done to me. And, and there's some good reasons for that. Number one, I didn't have the knowledge or the expertise to do the operation. But number two, I was in no shape to do it. Even if I knew how, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Paul says, don't be conformed. Don't be pressed into the world's mold. And I don't know about where your mind goes, but I think of a jello mold kind of out of vogue right now, but my grandma used to make this awesome jello in a mold, and it had um, fruit cocktail in it. Yes, it was so awesome. And don't even talk to me about putting in, like, carrots or celery or, you know, <laughs> cabbage in there. That's sickening. That's gross. Um, but the jello mold, you know, you just get it all in there, and it, it just, you set it up, and it, it's great. Or you might think of a die cast, where it's like, this is how it's going to be. But it's, you're conforming something into a shape of something else. And he says, don't be conformed to the spirit of this age, to this age. But then he says, but be continually transformed by the renewing of your mind. How's that happen? How do you get transformed? How does your mind get renewed? It happens by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. It's pointing to, without even saying the words Scripture or the Bible, it's sufficiency of Scripture for believers. This is not, you know, well, I like the Bible, so I'm living Scripture plus. It's Scripture plus whatever I want to put tag on, and that's going to help me through life. Believers believe that the, that the Word is sufficient for our faith. And Paul says, don't be conformed. Don't be, you need to be transformed. Well, the idea here is whatever you present yourself to will either conform you, you know, to, to this age for Satan's wicked pleasure and your ruin or transform you. God, by his spirit, through his word, for his glory and your good, That word, I want to go back to that word present because it's the, the, the same root word is found in Romans 6. Just flip over to Romans 6, verse 16. We'll look at one verse here. Where Paul is talking about presenting um, your, yourself to sin or to righteousness. So here's what it says. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So, whatever you present yourself to, 
whoever you present yourself to, will either conform you or transform you. And the big idea here, the big golden nugget in this passage is, is this. You need to submit your will to God. That's it. You need to present your will to him and allow him to shape it. We have all sorts of ideas of what we should do and what we should work on in our lives. And that's kind of an immature way of seeing how God works. It, you need to submit your will to God and present it to him and allow him to shape it. And your part is to be a living sacrifice, submissive to God's will and allowing the word of God to transform you and your thinking, which will lead to righteousness. Or you submit to the world and let it have its way and it's going to be ruinous. Because whether you recognize it or not, something is always being done to you. Look further in verse 2. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What's the will of God? You know, all sorts of people are like, I need to know the will of God, you know, for tomorrow. God's not going to give you the future. That's his, in his knowledge, and he's not going to share that with you. But what he is going to share with you is what you need to be doing right now. Right now. That by testing you may discern what the will of God is. In context, God's will here is not the decreed will of God that always happens where God says, it's going to happen, and it happens. It's the commanded will will of God that may or may not be done by us that's seen very clearly in the word of God and we either obey it or not it's the commanded will of God which is good and acceptable and perfect those are the good acceptable perfect things God commands it's like a coach giving workout instructions for a purpose for a reason the word is very clear here's how you should live it doesn't make every decision for you but God gives you wisdom based on the word I remember in high school, I was, some of you know I ran cross country, but my cross country career was not as stellar as it could have been if I had just listened to my coach all four years. I was all in first year, freshman MVP, okay? But I wasn't the MVP in my senior year. I was still on varsity, but I was one of the runners, not the runner. You know why? I'd, I'd be like, oh yeah, coach wants us to run six miles. Let's do three. Yeah, I thought I knew better. I didn't know better. With the word of God, God's like, here it is, take it or leave it. But you can't ignore it because of laziness, and you, and you can't ignore what he says because you think you know better. Who, let's go back to verse 34 of chapter 11. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? God-centered worship is a conscious decision on your part where you consecrate yourself to God, and it's a continual thing in your life. You wake up in the morning, and before your feet touch the ground, you're like, Lord, this day is yours. And as you go through your day, you keep, you keep presenting yourself to God. And why do we value it so much? We know God values it. But I think the, 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 the number one reason why we value God-centered worship so much is because God commands it. He commands it take you to a couple places. There's, there's tons of places in the Bible that talk about this, but you might want to flip over to Psalm 29. Psalm 29 is pretty clear about it. Look at verse 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. It's not a suggestion. Worship the Lord in the spl splendor of holiness. Uh, verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Go down to verse 10. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Now go over to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Look at a few verses there. Beginning at verse 1. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. 
Look down at verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And then it says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Hebrews 4 quotes that same verse in the context of the word of God. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And then he goes on to say that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Because according to Hebrews 4, God's voice is God's word. Sharper than a two-edged sword. So you you need to let let the scalpel of the word of God discern you so that you can discern the the will of God. It's like, here's what you should do because God says so. And then your response as a living sacrifice is to be submissive to God's will and allow the word to transform you so that you do what God wants. So because God is over all, and and as he gives us strength, we're to live in conscious, consecrated, continual God-centered worship. That's the ideal. And you can't mess around with worship. You, you, You just can't mess around with worship. Leviticus 10, there's Nadab and Abihu. You might want to look at that one. Numbers 6, Uzzah and the Ark. You might want to look at that one. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, anyone? Um, he, Hebrews 12, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Our God is a consuming fire. Consumes the sacrifice for good, using it for sovereign purposes. So present your body as a living sacrifice basically means submit your will to God. Don't be conformed to the spirit of the age. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by God's spirit through his word, so that you would prove what the will of God is, that you would obey what he commands. You would walk in obedient worship. Because God wants this for you and I. He wants us to live in conscious, consecrated, continual, God-centered worship. God-centered worship, G-C-W. That equals Y-W-S. God's in our worship equals your will surrendered. But there are barriers. To any good thing, there's going to be barriers. And there are barriers. Like, here's one. Your will not submitted to God. If your will is not submitted to God, there's a big barrier to God's in our worship. Sin is the source of all that's wrong in your life and in the world. Sinful, selfish, man-centered thinking and doing. If you think about yourself and your reason and your desire and your purposes over God's, and you think you know better than God, then uh, you're playing right into the devil's hands. Part of that is being devoted to the wrong things that are harmful to your soul. You shouldn't play with fire. Submit your will to God's. Another barrier is when you keep it in your head as knowledge, when it's intended to reach your will. The word of God is not just for head knowledge, but it is for living according to God. It has to get into your heart and your hands. The head, the heart, and the hands. There are two grave dangers facing believers every day. Untheological devotion, where you're just devoted, but you don't know what the word says. Or undevotional theology, where you know what it says, you don't want to live it. If it's in your head only, that that can be false worship. If it's emotion-driven and not rooted in your mind, that can be false worship. True worship is your will submitted to God's. Emotions may or may not follow in a given situation. You build off of Romans 12, 1 and 2. True worship starts with having your mind renewed. False worship is where your mind is set on the wrong things. Your will is not submitted. The renewal of your mind, the doing of the will of God, you set your mind on the truth, Your emotions will follow. But God wants your will submitted to his. In conscious, consecrated, continuous, God-centered worship. So how can we grow in that? How can we grow? How can we live our values? On our website, we have a paragraph on each one of our values. And for God-centered worship, it's that as believers, we seek to worship God in all of life. So it's all of life. All aspects of life. And when we gather together, we're committed to all ages being together, gathering that includes expository preaching, where the main point of the sermon is the main point of the passage. We want to have gospel-centered music that points us to God and not ourselves. We want opportunities to pray and give to God. 
In order to do that, you, you've got to think about a few things. Number one, think, you've got to think this way. Worship is my life. Worship is my life. All of my life. You cannot separate worship from the rest of your life. It isn't just about coming into here with, for a church service. Worship has got to be your life from God, through God, to God. You present yourself daily to God. You're living sacrifice, daily dying to self. Your will submitted to God's. That's the idea. Justinian von Welts was a, a baron in the Netherlands in the 1600s. And he pled with the state church to bring the gospel to the nations. And they said, we don't want to do that. So he goes to himself to Dutch New Guinea, uh, now Suriname in South America, and he renounces his title of baron. He renounces all his estates, all his lands. He pays his own way to be a missionary. And soon he filled a lonely missionary grave. But here's one of the things he said. What to me is the title well-born when I'm born again in Christ? What to me is the title Lord when I desire to be a servant of Christ? What to me to be called your grace when I have need of God's grace? All these vanities I do away with and everything I lay at the feet of Jesus, my dearest Lord, that I might have no hindrance in serving him. That's a will submitted to his. If worshiping Jesus is your life, you're not going to yearn to fit into the world. And you're going to devote your life, mind and body, to learn and do God's revealed will in his word. And Peter says this. He says, God has made us a kingdom and priests to our God. You want to live as a, as a priest to God? You offer every day your life as a sacrifice to him. Secondly, you need to do everything biblically. Biblically, uh, discern the commanded will of God equals know and obey the word of God. The world suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. And, and many professed believers are sliding down that slippery slope. We believe the scripture is sufficient. We've got to apply it that way. Many professing believers cave in because they don't have the immovable foundation of scripture set in their life. And so on many subjects, and we're going to get into this tonight at Grace Bible Institute, on many subjects, many professing believers are affected by and conform to the culture more than being transformed by the renewing of their mind. So every topic, you've got to approach it biblically. You've got to find solid footing on the Bible before you look at your personal feelings about it. We like to jump to our personal feelings. Here's what I feel about it. You need to see what the Word says. You know, in everything, what does the Word of God say and how should I respond in light of that? How does what Jesus did at the cross transform this? When your will is surrendered to God's, you live in God-centered worship, the Word is governing your life, you're going to change. In moment by moment worship as a spouse, as a, as a parent, as a child, as a student, as a worker, as a servant. Your response to error will change. The word warns us that falsehood will infiltrate and lead some away. Christ's real sheep know the truth. Your view of sin changes. A friend of ours wrote this this week. The ranks of Christianity are filled with the dead. Those carrying crosses for the purpose of daily dying, cru daily crucifying sin. It is filled by those who despise their natural inclinations, who hate their sin. Since Adam, our natural inclinations have been tainted with sin, and the Bible says very clearly that the natural man is not to be trusted. Any part of our nature that goes against the nature and purposes of God must die. Your priorities will change. Lilius Trotter gave up a promising career in art to minister to prostitutes in London and then to bring the gospel to Algiers in 1888. She had a weak heart and she labored 40 years among the filth and disease and ignorance and bigotry in, in these Algerian coastal towns. And she was a woman of literary gifts, of, of rare artistic ability, courage, common sense, deep faith. She was the favorite pupil of, of the famous artist John Ruskin. And so when she left for Africa, Ruskin said this, I have lost my one pupil with real talent. She has decided to throw away her life teaching pagans. Well, let me just tell you, no life offered as a living sacrifice is a throwaway. And no will surrendered to God's will is wasted. Your attitude towards others changes. You find it in your heart to forgive offenses and even overlook them and you hold no grudge. 
By the power of the Spirit, through the purging, cleansing of the Word of God, you obey what God commands, and He enables you to do what He calls you to do by the power of the Spirit. Your serving changes. It's no longer about what I can get out of it, but real love for Christ is expressed in service to Him and others, and He has given every believer gifts and empowers us to serve, but you don't wait till your gifts are all clear. You just start serving and and cheerfully caring for others, you'll figure it out as the Spirit works it out. And last thing is that our gatherings are going to change. If, if, we, if we think of it as worship as all of life, as, and part of all of life is coming in with the gathered church, then a life of worship, a whole church full of surrendered wills, will transform our gatherings. You live a life of God-centered worship, dependent on Him, directed to Him, so that when you come in here, to meet with the gathered church, our gatherings are transformed by God, not conformed to the world. You've got to refuse to let the spirit of the age dictate or flavor your expectations and your responses. You've got to think differently than the world. You've got to think biblically. You've got to come with no other expectation that, that God be glorified and encourage one another. You've got to come saying, I am going to come to encourage one another to love and good deeds. I'm not going to think about who didn't talk to me. Because our gatherings must be regulated by the word of God or it runs the risk of being conformed to the world. We've got to live what we say we believe. It's like Home Depot, less talking, more doing. All right? Now, you've got to talk. The gospel, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. You absolutely need to be talking to others about Jesus. Talking is part of your doing, but you can't be all talk. Let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. God centered worship. Your will surrendered. In conscious, continual, consecrated God centered worship. Living, sacrifice, holy, and acceptable to God, transformed by the renewing of your mind, wanting only what God wants. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you, you are God. And for the privilege, Lord, we thank you to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And thank you, Lord, that you are the one that does the transforming by the renewal of our minds, by your spirit, through your word, for your glory. And we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.